Hello, welcome back. It's the Future of Photography. I'm Chris Marquardt. We have Adrian and Jeremiah today. Imar is busy. So it's just the three of us today. And um, because Imar isn't, isn't here, we are going to do a tech computational <laughs> photography <laughs> update thing. <laughs> She'll be so pleased that she's there, missed she's one. She's up here. there. There she is. <laughs> Uh, so let me, oh, I can make my thing here a bit brighter. Not that that matters on the audio podcast version of this, but, um, today might be one that the visual side could help. And I think also today might be an episode where, um, well, we look into computational photography and I've dug out three stories and I think Jeremiah might enjoy those. Um, a lot because a lot of those are very movie production related, video related, film related. I like computational photography, especially when it works 70%. So there are happy accidents, which you can then yeah. take advantage of and tweak and organize. I like that. <laughs> Me too. Well, I, I, I don't think any of what we are looking, what, we, what we're going to look at today is in production or you can buy it but it's all scientific papers right now and proofs of concept um and the one source that i'm that i always look at for these kind of things is the youtube channel two minute papers and yeah. um i usually put a little a little um a little note Master in for these yeah a little asterisk on for for some of those that i find interesting and today's one of these episodes where, I, where i'm bringing you three two minute papers and uh, we're gonna look at those because the advances are amazing the first one we've already had something like that um adrian do you remember the episode it was an episode 143 where we talked about nerf the neural radiance fields, which I do remember, I remember being amazed that they managed to get a clear shot of the Trevi Fountain. Because exactly. as anybody, as anybody that's ever been there knows, there is no such thing as a clear <laughs> shot of the Trevi Fountain. Yep, and uh, and that's it's pretty much the same technologies, uh, the same technology, but with with uh, some really good advances now, and we are only talking a few months of additional work and a group of. Scientists has proposed the new selfie. They call it the Nerfy. So it is. Um, <laughs> let me let me let me let me move over to our little uh, browser thing here. I think I might have to. Oh yeah, I have to set that up. Of course. See, that's how well I'm prepared. But um, here we go. Nerfies, the selfies of the future. They call it, um, which. It's pretty much um, you, you. You remember that what they do is they take just a couple of photos. Um, well, maybe a bit more than a couple, but a few photos from different angles, and then they can generate a three-dimensional scene that you can move around in. So yes, um, and, and and if I remember rightly, they were also able to remove people that were and that were walking through or vehicles that were walking yeah. through and and they could give you different lighting effects of 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 these very you know, famous landmarks and they did it all with collections of images that were in the public yes. domain yes that's quite- that's exactly what they're doing um and they started applying that to selfies so they were looking at um well, pe- people pretty much taking just just imagine you having an outstretched arm, you have a, a mobile phone, and then you just move that around in front of your face, and get a few shots from different sides, and then let the algorithm do its thing, and then create a three dimensional representation of you. It's like photogrammetry a bit, but on a totally different level. And what these guys um, tried was the original Nerf algorithm, which didn't quite work well Um, if you're watching the video that's on the middle of the screen it's very blotchy and what they then managed is uh, to create like the high resolution amazing detailed version of that 3d uh, selfie including like individual strands of hair with beards and things that are notoriously difficult to get right from different directions and including, and that's the interesting thing, here's a guy wearing glasses, including the refraction in the glasses. So that's very interesting um, <clears throat> about the glass because 
uh, what's one of the things I've noticed in playing with my, with the lidar on my phone is, of course, you know, being based on light, the light goes straight through the glass. So, you know, you, what you end up with if you if you make a scan of a room with a mirror hanging on the wall, you end up with you know a, a hole in it. But then the the thing that would have been seen in the mirror, you know, pitched in the three D landscape, it generates way way back from behind it. Um, so, actually, being able to do glasses is quite impressive. Yeah. So, the- so the- theoretically, um, you can take a a nerfy of someone, generate it, run it through other AI, change the expression, add voice, <laughs> of course, voice, of course, and create a completely <laughs> artificial version of the person. Create create a new person. I think I think that's the next step in there. Um, because we already have like uh, still photos of people, so why not just make those like still photos of not existing people? So why not just make those three dimensional and uh, yeah, and then it's, and then put them and then put them on an animated puppet and there you go. Does it speak at all about what is the the output? So so again, calling back to some product that yeah, you know, some some technology that I have in my hands, which mm-hmm. is my phone. Um, the way that the LiDAR scanner looks like that, I've been playing with taking photographs of people uh, with the LiDAR as a 3D scan. Yeah. And uh, the way it works, as you might expect, is that it builds a, a 3D model and it will talk to you in terms of the number of faces that it's captured, not human faces, uh, sort of, you know, um, Pla- geometrical yeah, like triangles ge- right? geometrical po- faces yes polygon and and then it and then it texturizes those because it takes lots of photographs and so it's it's essentially doing texture mapping onto those faces that it captures and yeah. um, which of course is 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 quite amusing in its in its outcome so i, I took one uh, uh, the other day uh where the face came out it was, ended up with two images on the face so it looked like a face that was almost like a pyramid it, the reso- um, the lidar resolution isn't really that that good right no, now no it's not no yeah. it's just it's just for fun but but it's just trying to compare it to what you're seeing here in the nerfies is you know, if they could do individual beard hairs right that is, that is extraordinary compared to the technology the latest consumer technology yes. is is nowhere near that right now and 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 I, and I don't know how that geometrically works what they what they show in the video is that they have very detailed depth maps so there is that information, and then there is, of course, the texture, like the, the the photo part of it. And for I I would suppose, as it's still in an algorithm kind of stage, that you could make that into three dimensional models at according detail. I think that should definitely be possible with oh, the I amount think. of information they have. It's just that they have to do it, and then yeah, if if that turn, if that turns into a product, or if that finds itself in products in the future, um, it'll certainly then support whatever those products need so well i could see it being uh, output uh, as a obj or something imported into blender mm-hmm. and then worked on and then zbrush to fine tune it you know right. hairwise and sculpt it and then output as a very neorealistic uh, uh version of the original right uh, it just requires a little skill at this point <laughs> but soon i think the machines will be able to kind of overtake the skill and uh and at least create the kind of baseline foundation of a neorealistic human that we can then adjust and by adjust i think the main work it will be in the eyes uh which is getting better and better as we've pointed out in previous shows uh the kind of what's happening now in terms of, uh, you know, we are getting closer and closer to maybe not eliminating, but getting very close to decreasing the amount of the uncanny valley so that our first blush is that this is real. And then we have to be told that it is artificial. And then we start to look for clues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 that's a bit freaky. Yeah, a bit, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but yeah, it's clearly the way the technology is going. I agree with that completely. <laughs> so, but you remember, uh, so, sorry, uh, just uh, to complete the uh, the the thought is, do you remember when when uh, Meliers or, or no, when Lumiere first showed his train approaching? the station mm. as the one of the very first films people like fled from the theaters they thought this is <laughs> this is the devil's work this is too frightening <laughs> it's going to come and kill us so 
Uh, I think any real major advance in visual technology has always uh, kind of created an equal and opposite reaction until people get used to it either as entertainment or as uh, political, um, <laughs> what should I call it? <laughs> <laughs> tool, tool, tool. Yes. A political yeah. tool, yes. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's move on to the second one that I dug out, um, also recently published. Um, Jeremiah, you as a as a film director, um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a cheap thing to completely replace a sky in moving pictures, would it? It's nothing now. Huh? It's nothing it's, now. It's very nothing now. It's very very. Well, it, but it but uh, it still requires uh, it still requires visual computer. visual effects <laughs> artists and people who who kind of do some work there. Um, Not so much. Not so much. Not okay, so much. here's here's a one-click solution. How about that? So um, there's um, there is another well like another two-minute paper. You might remember from again quite a few episodes ago we talked about these um, image-to-image -image translation things where you'd have let, let me just bring up that video again where you'd have a day scene and the AI would turn that into a night scene um, yeah I remember and which, they could do yeah. weather they could do lighting they could do weather all lighting sorts, summer to winter yeah. and vice versa and mm -hmm. it's it's very jerky it's very low frame rate very low resolution no, nothing that you would use for um, in in, a, in an actual movie production, but uh, quite interesting. Um, and this is I don't know 2017, three years ago now, yeah. Um, and three years is a long time in AI. So what they have now done is come up with an algorithm that replaces skies, and that is I mean, it, as you said, Jeremiah, not that hard. Um, so what they're doing is they. They're putting like a big spaceship in the sky somewhere. But what the interesting thing here is, is that, well, first of all, it does it in motion. It does it pretty well. But it also changes the entire lighting of the scene to adapt to that sky. And that is, I think, a bit of a breakthrough. So, Yes, you're right. That, that, is, that is the heavy lifting. In other words, uh, yeah. replacing the sky is not the big issue. I mean, it, it uh, isn't. Adrian and I were talking earlier. It isn't an issue if you if you have clear boundaries, but the moment where they have a, they have other examples here where where people are walking through and um, those people will just blend in. They, they 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 cover the sky, so that would I guess still be some rotoscoping if you are in in visual effects production. But here it it changes the entire look and feel of a scene. They they replace a sky with like a. Uh, a summer scene or, or a rain scene and all of a sudden it's raining and the, the entire lighting, everything changes and, and fits that look. And that is, I find, quite impressive. At a good resolution as starting, well. This is starting to integrate in, in uh, beta terms, at least, and in rudimentary terms. Uh, they've been integrating it into Photoshop. Um, in terms of their sky replacement, uh, matching shadows, for example, uh, a shot of a lake uh, in broad daylight, put in a sunset sky, having the reflection uh, manifest in the lake, and then adjusting the, basically the lot, uh, which they're pulling from that reflection and the sky right. and applying that lot lookup table for those interested, uh, over the whole thing. And so that's as a still image in Photoshop is very possible. And what one does in terms of film is that that's just done with a faster computer frame by frame uh, as it moves through the, the process. But this is, I think, um, almost yesterday's uh, technology. And so we await uh, that technology in our phones. I, mm -hmm. I think this is astonishing, though, because yeah, you know, this is this is the create to to map lighting across a scene when you only have a two dimensional representation of it. It, it is is incredibly clever. So, do we know how they're doing this? Because you know, one way you could do it, perhaps, right, is to, uh, and we have apps on our phones that do this today, is to make an estimate of the three D scene 
from the 2D information. So so you get you got uh, yeah, there are plenty of apps out there now that will take just a, a, a bog standard two dimensional photograph and will it will generate a depth map from it with varying degrees of success. And then you could you you, know, you could then I could see how you could then light in three in three D. Like I mean that technology has been available apps like you know applications I should say it's not really an app like Cinema 4D which has been around for 20, 20 odd years where you can build your three D layouts and then you can light them accordingly um the so i can see that way of doing it or are they doing it by through machine learning where this is all ai machine it, learning based 100%. So, so is it is it that they're just providing it with the masses and masses of two-dimensional information uh, uh, images so that they can see what's what the kind of lighting goes with what skies or something like that i mean is, is that how they're doing uh -huh. it they're doing it with, by by building machine learning models that's that's well, my assumption. That's my assumption that they have a yeah. huge a huge basis of, uh, of of training data that they then train these algorithms on. And the the the, the thing is they and the difficulty is that um, I think it's relatively easy to do this on a on a still picture. But the moment it starts moving and it needs to be believable, it needs to not be jerky in any way. It needs to be consistent frame by frame, so you don't yeah. see any flickering and stuff. That is where the uh, where the difficulty lies right well, now. You, you, you mentioned people walking around through the scene. I mean, the lighting on a person would change, you know, completely potentially. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, if it, let's say it was an urban scene and they were walking along a street, there'd be a shadow from a building, they might walk through a bus stop or under a tree. You know, the, the lighting would need to change accordingly, wouldn't it? Well, well, part of it is is the new ray tracing algorithms that that require a little more processing on the GPU side. But but uh, when you are kind of uh, working with some of these uh, 3D software combinations, call it Unreal and ZBrush or Unreal and World Creator and whatnot, you can go off the shelf. For example, there are there are places that you could subscribe to for Substance. So you go, you know, I need a, I need an old uh, stone brick wall. You can pull it in just one, two, three into your computer. You can analyze exactly how many um, polygons you want with it. In other words, for the output, then you can address, you can make it muddy, wet. You can combine it with dirt. So you can do all of that stuff. Those same uh, shops that are building those um, products you know, those virtual substances are also uh, selling virtual lighting combinations, different skies, different um, star fields, all of that kind of stuff. So you can go, okay, I've created my landscape. Now I want a Mojave-like sunlit desert. You just go up and go boom. And then in the 3D, it just applies it. You can move around, shift it, and it is absolutely indistinguishable from real life. So um, these things are, are becoming uh, consumer-based um, in terms of being able to actually buy the kind of lighting that one needs. So, oh, so this is this is an interesting topic because right right now as, as uh, I have a pretty old laptop I think it's coming up for seven years old, <laughs> and I've been thinking to myself well when what am I ever going to need to buy a more comp powerful computer to do. I mean, I have an iPad that's about three years old, which is which is clearly a, a a lot better integrated between hardware and software, and it's a lot more capable. So I've been thinking, okay, so so for me as a consumer of this technology, um, video editing, that's about as hard as it gets on, on computation, right? So and and I can do that absolutely seamlessly. You know, no delays <laughs> for rendering on my iPad. Um, on my, you, so, my you, so, you sound like these people in the 90s who said, why would we ever need more than 640 kilobytes in a computer? But that's uh, absolutely, that's the whole point. That's my whole point. I'm, I'm owning that, right? I'm claiming it. I'm owning that ground, right? And so cause I'm saying, well, what is it that's going to cause me to need more computational power <laughs> than I have available today? Right? Software. Am I am I going to, you know, am I going to, I don't know, am I going to you start will... wanting to 
make videos and pretend actually it was snowing at Christmas and make my family videos will. look like it's snowy at Christmas. Of course you will. You will, you will soon have, you will soon have 12K uh, 360 degree video of things. You want, uh, you need right. the power. You need to be able to do these virtual landscapes that you will be living in in maybe 10 years from now. Huh? Also, you're going to need to prepare your Christmas cards well in advance now so you could right. really, you can work on yeah, them all summer, it. make them absolutely perfect so that they go out at exactly the right time. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's a solution looking for a problem, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, but th th things things will advance, things will change, things will be... I mean, for me... Explode. For me, I love it. I, I love it because it allows me to have greater control over that kind of middle ground between reality and fiction and working in that kind of zone in between them the ability to you know uh, put a a icebound tree in the middle of the mojave not that i would do that but maybe i would but <laughs> people, but I people might spot there, it there, <laughs> <laughs> there's visual iconographies that are very very powerful once one starts to play and have control it's like a painter with more technique but yeah the technique doesn't dictate the outcome but it allows the expression and the intention to be um to have in, uh, many paths to accomplishing that uh, uh, intention so the more uh sophisticated the tools that one is able to use the more control you could toss them you could use a little bit of them or you could let it dominate your life. Let's, let's be honest, right? They're building the holodeck, aren't they? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> That's where we're heading, right? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, doing. I'm not particularly interested in any of the intervening <laughs> technology, but I would like to go and visit a holodeck. <laughs> All right, so we uh, we are we're moving on to the third one, which I found the most impressive one of the three. And um, okay, so we're kind of at the theme of changing things after the fact, be it skies or be it other things in a in a photo or in a video. Um, one of the things that that caught my eye was retiming motion, and that's. Nothing unusual in in a video, right? You can you can slow it down, you can speed it up. There's the technology. Um, but what would you say if you uh, if, if you could retime individual people in a shot? How about that? So the the example that they're showing here is there's uh, three kids jumping into a pool and they are like jumping at different times and. Um, a bit later in the video, they show the same video with the three kids jumping at the same time into the pool. So it's the same Very video it's being changed after the fact. And what they have come up with is a technology that will allow them to um, pick individual people and then retime them in the same shot without any further information. Not just that. Um, here, here's a here's a video of like kids jumping on different trampolines in a trampoline hall, and they retime them to be jumping at the same time in the air. For example, <laughs> those kids they they are overlapping each other. There are they are on different layers behind each other. Um, yeah, there's that's a, a good point. Yeah, there's a there's a, a guy walking through the video, and they just take him out. So that algorithm, um, here's two people walking in front of each other. Um, that algorithm will take a person out or onto their own layer, including their reflection and their shadow, which would be a That's dead impressive. giveaway. If, that, if if you had like two people in a shot and you would remove one, you'd have to make very sure that you take their shadow and their reflection out. Otherwise, that would be a giveaway. Um, and yeah. what they do is... I'm they, with yeah. you, Chris. This is the most impressive isn't one, that, definitely. Isn't that yeah. mind-boggling? That's pretty mind-blowing, this... But is this a version, a visual version of, of uh, I'm not sure of the terms in audio, where you kind of s start to pull beats together until they actually synthesize? Um, yeah, but, but in, in audio, that would mean that you'd have a drum and a bass playing and both are out of time and you would separately change the drum and the bass without having the individual tracks at your Did disposal. Do you yeah. mean quantization, Jeremiah? Is that yeah. the term yes. you're looking for? That's yeah. the term. No, it's not because because quantization. We are talking about 
um, if if you are if you are a producer, you have different tracks for the bass and and the drums, so mm. you can retime and quanti quant quantize both of those separately. But here we have a mix. We have those things. Uh, you could if, look at the video. Yes. The guy in the yellow shirt yeah. walking through. They just take him out, or they just take some of those kids out um, because the the algorithm puts all of them onto separate layers wow. this that's, is that's a really good point bottling. that's that's a really good that's analogy good. i'm just going to repeat that so that everybody gets it chris what you said there is what we have with these videos is, is is the equivalent of an audio mix right you don't get access to the raw data everybody on their own track like you would do with quantization this is pulling all of this and creating it's reverse engineering it from from from, from a mix that's been bounced isn't it that's that's very impressive. Yeah. And and uh, how would one uh, use that in one's phone? Uh, do you know what? Right, uh, ha having a, a large they... extended family, <laughs> having a large extended family, and getting all the kids who think it's great to muck around not to look at the camera in the in the family photo groups, um, or they're hiding one behind the other and stuff like that. Actually, if you could you could shuffle all of that around and then make the grandparents happy by giving them a happy smiling extended family. <laughs> show. Yeah, but I I mean I mean as a as a as a director. Just imagine the, that one actor didn't really walk to their spot at the right time. They didn't hit the mark. And you can just go, yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's fix that in post. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, know where I, you know where I see the real benefits of this is not, not on your principal actors, but when you're doing crowd scenes with uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of extras, which you, know, you have your team all set it up and you right. choreographed it. And there's always one bozo who's like, <laughs> yeah not with it uh, you could eliminate them you can actually control where the crowd moves uh, certainly background wise it i think it does offer uh, tremendous assets um for background manipulation of of uh, background players in feature movies That's right sure. yeah yeah uh, yeah so I mean, yeah that, to be able to play with that with with the i think it's the reflections one it's incredible because that's the, those are so ephemeral. I mean, with the children bouncing on trampolines, they are clear. They're standing out from the background. And yes, you, you could imagine an algorithm that would be able to spot that as a child yeah. and stick it on its own layer. Um, the the way, reflections in glass you know, windows as people walk by, though, that's such an ephemeral thing. To be able to spot that, I guess it must be linked to the movement. Yeah, must be spotting the reflection based upon the fact that it has a movement pattern that's aligned. It's, to the lo principle. it's looking at things that but move in unison because shadows yes. and, and uh, reflections will do that. That's a very good word yes. for it. Yes, yeah, but still astonishing. Still astonishing. Still, yeah, that that really blew my mind. So <laughs> we like it. That was good. Good. Whew, I'm glad you like it. So let's <laughs> move on to. So our... what have we learned? What have we learned? What does that mean for the future of photography? I need, mm, I need a better see. phone. Yeah. <laughs> a better phone. It, iPhone 18. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And 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 if you and if you have a choir of people and they sing out of time and out of tune, and you have the same algorithms for audio, you could uh, re-time them and retune them in a completed mix. How about that? Don't tell me you've just reinvented nice. auto-tune for groups of people. That sounds a terrible <laughs> For thing. individuals in a group of people, that would be... Th okay, that's the next step. That's um, maybe okay, five years down the road. There's the next road. 10 years of pop music sorted then. <laughs> right. So, I think what we're saying is the tools that, uh, that are about to be unleashed on, uh, on the kind of consumer-based uh, image makers are going to allow them to have almost an unlimited um, uh, an unlimited way to manipulate reality and get further away from uh, photography as a truth teller. Hmm. And that's a good thing. And yeah. that, Is that good or bad? That would, that, would, that would be my next I, question. For an artist, it's a good thing. For a newsmaker, uh, it's not so good. Hmm. Or a news for a journalist, not so good. Okay, um, let's move on to the picks of the week, and we. I'm happy to say we all have picks of the week, including myself, because I, I, uh, I found one well, last minute. 
<laughs> Let me Good go stuff. first because I chose one that is about as far. I have actually two. You chose two, um, yeah. <laughs> I chose two because one is absolutely as um, as far as you can possibly get from uh, AI. <laughs> okay, which of the two uh, do you want first? The the top one. The top one. That would be uh, this one. David Baradia. Yeah. So what are we looking at? You're looking at someone who uses uh, foodstuffs uh, to create space oh. shots Hold on. <laughs> on his open air scanner. So this is nothing to do with AI, nothing to do with uh, CG, nothing to do uh, with uh, technology as we have been discussing. This is a flatbed flatbed scanner with foodstuffs that he sprinkles uh, <laughs> on the plate and layers them in Photoshop to create. Uh, <laughs> this looks like this, this so looks like these, the solar system galaxy kind of thing. Yeah, correct. And his his work is really fantastic. And and. Uh, I, I actually think that this is probably his least effective photo, but when you really look at his work, it is, uh, I, you know, you go like, oh, yeah, that was CG or a telescope. No, all of this stuff is literally orange and flower. So and that would be the equivalent to, to using practical versus practical effects versus CGI in film. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's my first pick just to give us a... Um, a little contrast. Sounds very, very clever. It looks great and sounds messy as well. Could be fun. It's <laughs> yeah. messy. Your kids will love it, though. Um, uh, so that's good. And, and the second one is something that I've been experimenting with very successfully, though I'm a little reticent uh, to uh, to recommend it. Uh, it's called Ramini. Uh -huh. And what it does when they say AI photo enhancer, I took, I think I posted this on our Discord, where I took a frame from uh, an old 16 millimeter home movie that my father had taken a million years ago. I'm a young, small child. I'm sitting on the lap of my great grandmother. And it was, it was pretty out of focus. It, it, if it was color, it all had faded. I pulled that in, digitized it. I went and I, I did some neural color on it. Uh, it was still out of focus, and then I used Ramini. What Ramini does is it it takes the image, it uploads it to its server, and it applies sharpness on eyes. It replaces glasses, even chins, mustaches, and and it creates an illusion of absolute sharpness. And it does so in an amazing way. Absolutely great. What worries me a bit about it is I'm not sure about the data collection on the actual um, application. So uh, unless I kind of drill down a little bit more, I, I did not, f I felt it wanted me to subscribe at a very high price. It was, uh, I, I just did a little bit of uh, one or two days of experimenting and then canceled it until further notice. But the technology that it uses is really astonishing hmm. i think the beginning of many so is it a bit like face app where that, that had a huge controversy about where the data goes and things i don't know because i, I you know like apple to its credit now starts to list all of the things oh that's that true they have, a, mm, they have a seen privacy that, so, here yeah. we go app privacy data yeah. used to track you identifiers contact info user content usage data identifier diagnostics hmm, yeah I think I think the I think the privacy tiles for Facebook and Co look a bit worse. <laughs> no, no, they, they most. By the way, they most certainly do. But I I, I always want to study that a little uh, carefully. Makes a lot of sense. Yes. Before I kind of sub subscribe because God knows where these things originate from. Anyway, but the technology itself is really very impressive. Cool. Thanks for sharing and, and, and that. And by the way, before I before I let everybody go, this is my surprise here. This arrived yesterday. Oh, the jolly oh, look! The new at? one. Oh, you got a jolly the, look. Is that is that the better one? The one that is not broken. The first version wasn't in good shape, but oh yeah, this is the oh, new one. I don't one. know. I don't even remember ordering it. <laughs> this is the second edition you have there. Yes, and that is the good one. I'm excited. 
Yeah. I haven't opened the box, obviously, but I wanted to share it. And it takes... Oh, that's great. Well, for, uh, those, for those that don't know, the Jolly Look is a cardboard camera. Not anymore. That, is it not? Oh, they, it was a cardboard camera. They have graded it to a wooden uses... type con- construction now. Oh, wood? Oh, no, they upgraded to wooden, uh, and it uses... It shoots Fuji Instax Mini, I think, doesn't it? Yes. Looks yeah. like an old, uh, old, old camera with the bellows Kodak, and everything. It looks like a, yeah. ah, I didn't and realize they'd done a second I think version these are of it. Lenses of some description. I don't. Know. Uh, filters, I think. I know. Color filters. I, 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 backed the first one, and that was a disaster quality-wise. They, <laughs> they, they had this produced in China, and uh, it ended up being. It ended up not working for like eighty percent of people. Quality was horrible, but they, um, they managed to still kind of to pay people back and make good and they came up with a second version and I'm I've been following this. this is one of those projects those kickstarters that have been going on for I don't know four or five years I've it, it was possibly, possibly, it possibly yeah, but I, no. I have no idea in and fact, it was I worth every cent it, it was worth every cent just for the story just to uh, for the entertainment by following along and 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 being excited for them and and f- yeah it, it was it was almost like a bit of a movie going it, into yeah. well, next I, week i i will post up uh, my first oh, definitely. jolly look photo on discord yeah, one of the, the the best use i found for a first generation jolly look actually was um some of the guys in the film photography community were using were cutting them up because they were made of cardboard to create backs for medium format cameras instant backs for things like bronicas and stuff like that where where the, the really? those are less readily available yeah yeah did they work uh with a with enough tape yes <laughs> <laughs> okay adrian what is your pick okay i've kind of got the antidote to computation uh this week um i this is a youtube channel i found very very recently and i've just dipped my toe in the water um but it's 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 proper hardware it's a youtube channel called gaffer and gear (laughs) and and this is the channel um run by uh, an aussie gaffer who tells it like it is right and he's got reviews of all sorts of stuff you know lights and lighting systems and hardware and just uh, you know it, it, it's just if, if you want if you if you get tired of the computational stuff and all of that just just go wash this guy yeah you know, give you the good aussie lowdown on all the stuff that he has to deal with day to day cool wow, that's looks fun. looks yeah. fun looks fun behind the scenes stuff i love I'm, behind the scenes stuff i'm sure my wife is gonna love that <laughs> well, you know, I I have, yeah, you know, I know. I, I, um, having having sold off a load of cameras last year and being a bit bit more intentional about the number of cameras I have at the moment, um, I still haven't managed to shake my love of lights and and other hardware and stuff like that. I still still really yeah you know, enjoy diving into that sort of thing. All right, more so, on that in a couple of shows to come. Actually, good. My pick of the week is a link to a. German blog entry, um, but never mind. Uh, German isn't isn't that important. It's about camera and their sound. So all you'll have to do is play a sound. And I'm I'm not sure if if I if I wired this up so we can. Can you hear this? Um, Hold on. I can't believe you have this. I have this book. Yes, I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> okay, so it's it's in the recording. Listen. Which of the three cameras pictured here is it? A Polaroid SX70, a Holga 120S, or a Pentacon 6TL? It's definitely not the Holga. Um, I'm going to go with the Polaroid SX70. Okay, listen, listen. Does this sound like a Polaroid? Wait. No. No, it's the Pentacon Six. Click. Okay. Correct. Green. Okay. Okay. So, so you you get to do a little quiz, and you let's try another one. This is great. Polaroid 320. I'll, I'll, I haven't done this yet, so I might I, go for I, the Olympus. I would go with the, that sounded like a motor wine to me, so I'm going to say Listen again, listen Olympus again, listen again. It's not the Lupitel 166, because I have one of those. That doesn't is sound anything like it. There's a at the end of Polaroid that. Maybe it is the Polaroid, Polaroid then. 320. Okay, let's, cool. let's, let's go with Jeremiah Polaroid 320. Oh, correct. Okay, ah, good. Well done, Jeremy. So yeah, I you get to because I have a one nine five. So, I so similar. you get to do a whole bunch of these, and in the end, you get nothing but uh, a 
But the good feeling that nothing. you know your <laughs> film <laughs> analog cameras, and um, I think that is beautiful. So that is it for this techie episode. Next week, I think we'll do something 3D, but um, we'll find out more about this. Uh, well, we'll find out more when Jeremiah prepares it for us. So I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> what is this mysterious third dimension of which you speak? <laughs> yeah, we are in 2D here. We're not doing a 3D <laughs> podcast just yet. Um, you can, of course, find us over at uh, on the socials at uh, TFOP now on Twitter, on Insta, on our Discord, which, hey, the discussions are exploding there. So I'm really happy for all of you joining us there and um, the links and everything are in the show notes in the description. So check them out, click them, say hello, and we'll be back next week. Until then, everyone, take care. Bye.